Hi, and welcome to Axelbank Reports History and Today Conversations with America's top nonfiction authors and why their books matter right now. I'm Evan Axelbank, and today we're going to speak with Kate Anderson Brower, the author of Elizabeth Taylor The Grit and Glamour of an Icon. This is her fifth book. She's a former reporter from Bloomberg News and has written for many newspapers and magazines. And she was on the first episode of this show, the 32nd episode of this show, and now the 117th episode of this show. Kate, thanks so much for being here once again. Thank you, Evan. You've been very prolific. My gosh. (laughs) I never thought 117 would happen, but we're here we are and there's no plans to stop. So uh, rolling right along. Before we get into Elizabeth Taylor, I want to start. Uh, I want to invite listeners to our Patreon page to ask for your support in keeping the show going. Go to patreon.com slash Axelbank History. We will donate part of your contributions to a charity that promotes children's literacy. On my favorite episode of Curb Your Enthusiasm, there is a scene where Larry is buying sunglasses for a woman who's in her 80s. And the salesperson says to him, you know, Elizabeth Taylor wears these glasses. And Larry goes, Elizabeth Taylor, get out of here. And that was the selling point. He buys the sunglasses. So, Kate, what does it say that her name still had the cachet in 2001 when that episode was made 10 years before she died at nearly 70 years old, that just saying her name would help the listener understand that he was buying special sunglasses? Mm -hmm. I love that. I I haven't (laughs) seen that episode. Um, It's the best episode. It's called Beloved Aunt, by the way. It's a fabulous uh, episode. But go ahead. I got to watch that. Um, It says that she... I think that's a great way to to kind of frame her life is that she was so famous for really she she was bewildered by her level of fame at that point because everywhere she would go um she was mobbed by paparazzi and it was kind of this mythic character that had been created around her this this she hadn't been in anything since you know the Flintstones and that was not one of the high points of her career <laughs> um and she would look around and say to her assistant, you know, he told me she would say, I have no idea why I'm famous anymore. And I think it's because she was the first person to really capture the public's attention because of, of course, her beauty and her talent, but her personal life was just, it's a soap opera. It may not have been the highlight of her career, but it was probably the highlight of the Flintstones to have her in the Flintstones. Um, Before we get to uh, her life and her impact, I I do want to ask you, um, you've written so many presidential books now, I think four of them. So mentally, how did you adjust yourself from writing about presidents and writing about the White House residents and first ladies and vice presidents and then change your mind to be able to write about Elizabeth Taylor? Well, you know, I mean, you're a history buff, and I think when you're interested in history, it doesn't have to be. I'm I'm also really interested in Tudor history and Henry VIII, and, you know, I'm I'm just interested in uh, what motivates people to act certain ways, and I've, I've always been interested in Elizabeth because of how she transformed celebrity. I think if you look at the Kim Kardashians of today, they wish they could be as impactful as she was, right? She's the last person from the studio system, but she recreated what it means to be a celebrity by using it, uh, using her fame in a really revolutionary way. And I I just was fascinated by that. I I will admit that uh, Elizabeth Taylor is, of course, someone who I knew of and had seen, but I wasn't fully familiar with her life, frankly, until I picked up your book. Um, uh, 79 credits, as an actress on IMDb, a dozen major movie awards, eight husbands, four children, um, and probably millions of words already written about her, including one by a very big name. I saw Kitty Kelly wrote a book, but this is the first authorized biography. How much responsibility did you feel to, to be the biographer who would write this biography and get access to this trove of documents? that nobody had seen before. I mean, as a journalist, I felt, and I'm sure you can relate to this like a kid in a candy store, because I had access to all of this material that other people hadn't seen. But I did feel a lot of responsibility to 
paint her as portray her as a full fledged person. I mean, that's what she always said about herself. She was um, she could be very funny. She could be very selfish. She could be very generous and empathetic. I mean, she was complicated. I, I, I really learned that she was, I think the more intelligent you are, sometimes the more complicated you are. And that is certainly the case with Elizabeth. Did, did the family have expectations of what the final product would look like when they sort of opened the door to these documents for you? It's interesting that her four children were actually the most open, especially her son, Chris Wilding. He said, you know, I'm just going to tell you what it was like having Elizabeth Taylor as my mom. And he was very open about her addictions um, and how kind of traumatic it was. But the people who were the most protective of her are the people who worked for her and her assistant, and he loves her. And so there there was definitely a back and forth in terms of when I showed them the manuscript, um, they wanted to make sure that things that made Elizabeth kind of, that left a bad taste in your mouth about her were put in context, you know, and I did that. You opened the book with a discussion of her relationship with the paparazzi. And I do have some questions about the paparazzi for later. But your scene is set, your opening scene is set in 1987. And you sort of have her remembering what it was like to be chased through the streets of Italy and of Rome um, on her own property as well by the paparazzi. And some of them really got flagrant with her. And I, it was really hard for me to listen to because the notion that You'd be entitled to someone's physical space is really beyond me. Um, But you say that she and her husband, Richard Burton, um, practically invented the paparazzi. So uh, I am curious, how did they shape and she shaped the paparazzi? And more importantly, how did the paparazzi shape her? I think that, um, yeah, their relationship and what I was struck by working on this book in, you know, the 21st century and looking back at how she was treated as a woman in the time because of her relationship with Richard Burton, she was kind of a seen as the scarlet woman. She broke up Eddie Fisher and Debbie Reynolds relationship. Then she broke up supposedly Richard Burton's marriage. Of course, it takes two people to do that. She was always blamed. And so I think that um, there was this voyeuristic interest that people had. I mean, everybody in this country had an opinion about Elizabeth or Debbie and who they preferred. And so I think the paparazzi couldn't get enough of her in Rome, you know, with Richard uh, while they were filming Cleopatra. And I think that there, because there's no one like her today, it's hard to kind of put her in context. But I found this great quote from a New Yorker magazine film critic who said, when Elizabeth was 31 years old, he said that she was less an actress by now than a great natural wonder like Niagara or the Alps. She was so much a part of our culture that um, it was totally suffocating to be her. It, it's so funny because I wrote the same exact quote down from the book, but I, but the, the 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 first part of the um, the question that I had that included that quote is that you compared her to three other women, Jackie, of course, Jackie Kennedy, Marilyn, Marilyn Monroe, and Elizabeth II, meaning the Queen. Um, you write that they were all essentially prisoners of the lives that they'd either been born into, either cultivated or an unwittingly grown into, right? Because it depends mm-hmm. on which person you're talking about. But you say that Elizabeth the Taylor, as opposed to the Queen, flourished. Um, she was not an actress, as you said. She was a forge of nature. Um, how? What was in her that you found made her able to flourish under these pressures where some of the other women who you wrote about there kind of folded into themselves after their need to be in the public eye faded. I think that she had a, you know, it's, it's one of those things that's hard to calculate, but she did have an inner strength because if you looked at it on paper, you would think someone like, um, you know, Well, Marilyn Monroe was someone who had no family support. You know, I don't know if you're familiar with her. Her childhood was horrendous. And and she was hair before my time, I will admit. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. (laughs) But, you know, I mean. Our time, I should say. Our time. Yes. Yeah. No. But I mean, I'm fascinated by Elizabeth's mom and her relationship with her mom, because I think if you look at Judy Garland, Marilyn Monroe, 
These are women who didn't have uh, a strong mother who protected them. And so Elizabeth's mother was a complete stage mother. And um, she pushed her into the industry and then uh, was there every step of the way behind the camera directing her, essentially, because she had always wanted to be an actress. And I think that saved Elizabeth. I think she bristled at it and hated it, but it gave her a foundation. She never... Because I think she would have said she was never, um, you know, uh, experienced the casting couch that so many stars of her time did because she was so famous after National Velvet when she was 12 that no man was going to try to take advantage of her. I couldn't get over 7,400 personal writings that you say were meticulously cataloged. Um, How did it feel for you to read these very personal letters? Because even one that didn't get you know overly intimate, but it was still very heartfelt. It's hard to to even read that and pick it up. I mean, you feel like you're reading something that wasn't intended for you, right? You sort of have this dirty feeling. Um, how did you kind of get yourself to a place where you could read these writings without feeling, as you put it before, voyeuristic? Yeah, I mean, it, they really were an open book. Her her family and. Um, the trustees of her estate who manage, you know, um, her legacy really. And they, they have an archivist who has all of this meticulously online. And actually I had a password protected document because I'm in DC and they're in Beverly Hills. Wow. And I went out there and met with them and went to their offices. And then after that, I kind of worked from home during COVID on this. And I did feel Sometimes like the letters that she wrote to her doctor, I don't think the love letters to Richard were that, you know, they're certainly passionate and over the top and crazy, some of them, but that seems a little bit safer space. I think the harder stuff was when she was writing to her doctor, for instance, like about hip surgery that she was going to have. And she's basically begging him to make sure that she gets the painkillers she needs and not to treat her like an addict, even though she was one. Mm -hmm. And so anything between like a patient and doctor, I felt a little bit iffy about. Um, Hip hip surgery, though, that's not like the worst thing you could read about, I guess, right? (laughs) Yeah, yeah. I thought you were going to say something else, but okay, hip surgery, it's not the worst thing, yeah. Yeah, but she had three of them. Yeah. And, you know, yeah. can you imagine three hip surgeries? No. Yeah. I don't think it's even. So I, it, <laughs> one of them went wrong. She has two hips. But like it was just she was I was really interested in the psychology of somebody who seems to have everything and then is an addict their entire life, too. You and s- I wanted to get into that. You said that she couldn't remember a time before she was pay- famous. So b- but before she was famous, right, she was a little kid, right? We all don't remember the beginnings of our lives. So who was she when she was born and who was she born to? Her parents were from the Midwest. Her father was uh, related to a very uh, wealthy, uh, successful art dealer. Her mom was an actress. Um, she gave up acting to to be a mom, she said, and a wife. And they moved to London and she had a really idyllic childhood before World War II. She lived in a little area of London called Hampstead Heath, which was beautiful and green. And she had a country house where she wore, rode her horses and was very idyllic. Um, but then when the war broke out or was about to break out, she and her family moved to L.A. And her father opened up an art gallery in the Beverly Hills Hotel. And that's when her mom said, because there's a great unpublished memoir that her mom wrote. And she just said, you know, people would stop us on the street and say, Elizabeth looks just like Vivian Lee. She should have been her daughter and gone with the wind. You've got to get her into movies. And it was almost like a foregone conclusion. She had to be a star. What was the particular quality that someone noticed, you know, that this person noticed and said, God, there's just something about her that I think we could mold into maybe not global icon, but at least get them into movies, you know, from the, from the beginning here. Well, I mean, you would say her beauty because she had those gorgeous blue eyes that looked violet in certain lights and her porcelain skin and raven hair and all of that she kind of had an older face that that came back to haunt her but on a on a little girl's body and there was something really beautiful about that but i would say it was her acting i mean she was just a good actress when she yeah, you know, yeah she I, loved- I wanted to ask though so you you said that she was 
I, I think you're arguing that she's in touch with herself in a way that was uncommon for a young person. But you also say, you know, that that's critical for an actor. Um, how did she have to develop that? Or was that something that was in her from birth? I think she's a na- she's a naturally gifted actor and she never had any training. She got up on stage and her first audition um, for Lassie Come Home, she went on stage and had to pretend that there was a dog on the stage that she was petting and there was no dog. And, you know, to do that when you're that young, eight, nine, 10, like that is, a, I have a nine-year-old and I don't think she could pull that off, you know? So it's it's just incredible. She was born with it. Um, I, I, I hate to talk about myself on this show, but I will tell you that at some point I was doing some kind of audition for something and I have no idea what it was, but they wanted me to pretend I was eating a bag of potato chips and that I was enjoying it. And I basically said, I'm not doing that. That's stupid. And <laughs> I never became an actor. Um, her, her her first starring role, as you said, was in National Velvet. Um, she plays this girl who wants to be a jockey among in like a boys club kind of thing. Um can we read too much into how that foreshadows the rest of her life as like this hard driving woman, not inclined to take any BS um, or is that going too far and looking at the role? Probably going too far. I mean, I think she thought she was velvet Brown and she thought that role was hers because it reminded her of, I mean, she loved animals. She loved riding horses, you know? And so for her that, that and she fought for that role and she said she ate, a lot so she could grow because she wasn't tall enough at the time. And there's this kind of lore that she built around it. I think that, um, and she, it's funny with Elizabeth because she repeats the same stories in, you know, all of these interviews that she did. And it's like, they get more and more dramatic as you go on. Like, you know, she kind of builds this, you know, the, the idea that she could at 10 years old, just eat a lot and grow five inches is kind of like hard to believe, but it's a great story. So she was, she was an actress. So yeah. everything was dramatic. Um, when I think about Hollywood starlets, you know, or even music, you know, musicians, you think about, you know, Britney Spears or uh, Miley Cyrus, and they sort of begin playing this kind of innocent character who's sort of exploring her teenage years. And as the paparazzi gets a hold of them and as you know, Hollywood and fame and money begin to get a hold of them. They often have difficult times and the public watches them go through really, really difficult things. Um, They're caught doing drugs. They're partying. Britney Spears got that famous haircut one day, which everyone went crazy ev- uh, over and then reappearing as kind of a changed person. I, you know, they go on Instagram and say, I've grown from all this. And now I'm sort of this new person. Um, Did you find echoes of that in Elizabeth Taylor, as you studied her, you know, when you compare her to the journeys of these modern starlets that we see. Baking from our childhood just sticks in the memory, doesn't it? We never set off on holiday without piles of Tupperware. And there'd always be Bakewell slice, flapjacks and tray baked scones in the boot. Do you not do that, Lisa? No. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> Sadly, I do not stack uh, the Tupperware in the back of the car when we go off on holiday. Aww. Welcome to Small Ways to Live Well, a new podcast from The Simple Things magazine. Season two is a pick-me-up tonic that helps us make the shift from winter to spring. A six-week suggestion box full of things to note, notice and enjoy about the season. Search for Small Ways to Live Well on your podcast app. Yeah, I think that, you know, it's interesting because I think that um, she never had any real regrets and she always felt that she only owed herself and her family. You know, she was never going to apologize for what she did. So if she just had decided to shave off all her hair in a gas station bathroom, which I think is what Brittany did. I think, yeah. It's amazing. 20 years ago already, but yeah. Yeah, I can't wait to read her book, by the way. Um, It's like... She wouldn't have felt the need to then, if Instagram had existed, Elizabeth wouldn't have then gone on it and said, oh, I'm, you know, this is why I did this. Because I think she was, she was unapologetic about her mistakes. And um, 
And she did get taken advantage of, I think, by Richard. And the more I read about their uh, relationship, it's like just kind of gut-wrenching where he's apologizing for fights and he's talking. At one point he said if he had if he had reacted to her about some a particular fight they had, then she would have ended up in her grave. I mean, the idea that I think there was a lot of violence between them. And so she, and he totally rode that wave with her because he started getting a lot more money because of her. I want to ask about the relationships in a second, but I do want to ask about the money right now. Um, some of the descriptions that you gave in the book and that other articles I've seen, I mean, she had a fabulous amount of money um and she loved spending it um why did she love spending it and what did she love spending it on her first pay you know paycheck she got her mom a pin at a jewelry store in the beverly hills hotel and she just that was always very dear to her the idea that jewelry was a symbol of love and affection and for her it didn't matter how it well she said it didn't it helped if it was several carrots but she liked all gifts and towards the end of her life she expected everyone to bring her a gift and there was one great story that her son Chris Wilding told me where in the 90s a prince comes to visit her at her house in Bel Air and prince is you know He's wearing one of his bedazzled suits. He's got the red, he has a red rose in his hand. And Elizabeth assumes that the rose is for her, but really it was just a prop that he carried around for himself. And she says, oh, thank you so much. And took it right out of his hand. And he was kind of like, what? and if she liked what you were wearing, Joan Collins told me she tried to take one of her pieces of jewelry. And she was like, oh, Elizabeth was notorious. If you if you saw her at a party or sat next to her at a dinner, she would just say, oh, I like that necklace. Can I have it? It was a strange thing. And she loved jewelry, but she understood it. The Krupp diamond, her signature piece, 33 carats, <laughs> owned by a Nazi arms dealer. And she said, wouldn't it be nice for a little Jewish girl like me to have this ring? Because she converted to Judaism. I mean, it was, she had a great sense of humor and a, just a, a joie de vivre that is just infectious. I love that. Uh, I love the diamond story. Um, but the way she got her money is important too, because she demanded um, proper payment from these studios. And that's a really hard thing to do for even the most aggressive type A male to do, to demand money from your bosses, because you're always worried they could say, see ya. Um, but she was willing to go to them and say, this is what I'm worth. How did she do it? Yeah, I mean, for Cleopatra, she's the first person to get paid a million dollars for a film. And back then, we're talking about early 60s. It was a huge amount of money. Still is, but then it was enormous. And it wasn't only that. I mean, um, she demanded to pick her director. She picked Mike Nichols to do Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf, which I think is her best film. So she demanded a level of control and 10% of the gross of from Cleopatra so she was a shrewd business person and I think it comes down to the idea that she knew that she was making them so much money and you know I interviewed Whoopi Goldberg about Elizabeth because they were friends and she said look Elizabeth told me you're a you're a black actress um, you are gonna have ups and downs in your career because we all know this town is got some racism and sexism to deal with so you demand that you get a gift at every movie that you do get get a gift not just the money but in addition get something nice and Whoopi said you know she looks around her house and sees all these gifts that she got because of Elizabeth and so she passed that down like you know you're you're putting your agent's kid through college and they would yeah right yeah that's a good you way know? to put it. and they would bring her like give Whoopi Goldberg like a car or a necklace or something in addition to the money for the movie yeah I mean these are high value things I mean pieces of art you know um for Elizabeth it was always jewelry and for Elizabeth if it was a gift from a studio or studio head it had to be pretty good she wanted a Cartier Bulgari you know um, she, it was funny to me because she just knew so much about jewelry that the head of Christie's jewelry department said he had never met somebody who, other than himself, who knew 
the provenance of all the pieces. And she actually kept each piece of jewelry in its original box and wrote the name of the man who had given it to her. But I tell you, my next contract, I might ask for like a like a <laughs> like a Mets jersey or something like that. In addition to this salary. Um uh <laughs> all right, you know we're getting here at some point. By the time she's 32 years old, she'd been married to four men. Um, she was halfway through her marriages at that point. The marriages all ended for different reasons. Um, did you try to do a deep psychological dive into this part of her life? What was she looking for with all these men? I like that you said they ended for different reasons, because a lot of people who don't really think about it in context, you know, is that she was married many times, eight times to seven men, but each one of those men was so different. And if you look at Nikki Hilton, he literally abused her, right? And Michael Wilding was boring. Uh, Mike Todd <laughs> dies in a plane crash. I like, was going to say that. And it wasn't all divorces either. Yeah. Right. Right. Like, a, you're right. Um, uh, Eddie Fisher was kind of a rebound. I think she was looking for an escape from... She wanted someone to help her with the business of being Elizabeth Taylor. It was suffocating. It was all consuming. But then at the same time, she wanted someone who had their own life, their own. She loved self-made men. She loved men that were kind of brash. She she needed somebody who could kind of give it back to her. Um, she just was a. Uh, I feel like she didn't know what she was looking for when she was in her 20s. And I think a lot of people might feel the same, you know, Nikki Hilton was not going to be her, you know, great white knight and carrying her off into the, you know, wilderness. It was that she needed somebody who was going to both nurture her, fight with her, protect her. I mean, she was looking for a lot. Hmm. Um, you might appreciate this reference. Uh, Richard Burton is sort of her Grover Cleveland of husbands. Um, she was married, divorced, and then married again. She said she truly loved him in a way that she seldom expressed otherwise. What do you think he offered her that she just didn't think anybody else could? Intellectually, they were really matched. You know, they were well matched. Um, she loved his vulnerability. I mean, when they first met, she thought he was they met at a pool party and she was not impressed with him because he kind of put on a bit of an act. And then they met on the set of Cleopatra and he was really hung over and he couldn't bring the coffee cup to his lips because his hands were shaking so badly. And so she had to bring the coffee cup up. And I think for her, it was, she liked to be surprised. She was surprised that he wasn't this arrogant stage actor who was going to come in and act like he knew everything. He was from a, you know, small Welsh mining town. Um, and the fact that he was an alcoholic, I think strangely, you know, it was that wounded, complicated person like Montgomery Clift that Elizabeth loved and wanted to help fix. Um, Hollywood as an industry was, of course, too slow on lots of civil rights Um on lots of aspects of the civil rights movement, but many of the actors, some of them at least were famously invested in it. And she was one of them. What was her relationship to the civil rights movement? You know, she was really good friends with Sammy Davis Jr. She did um, fundraisers for the NAACP. She was very progressive. Um, but when I think of her activism, I do think more of what happened later in her life, you know, with meaning AIDS. the rehab and Betty Ford and you no, know, I think of HIV and AIDS uh -huh. as kind of like the pinnacle of her life when yeah. she was, you know, she was at her strongest when she was helping other people who she she couldn't stand to see injustice, and I think for her, she had so many gay men in her life, and so I really, when I came to this book, I wanted to just write about. This is the kind of political side of it. I wanted to write about her marriage to John Warner, this Virginia Republican senator, and how she used her years in Washington to become the first major uh, AIDS activist. And, and she called out President Bush very yes. famously. He doesn't know how to spell AIDS, right? right. I love, I mean, she just... Um, I think it also is interesting in, in looking back at American history in the early 80s, how 
just radioactive this issue was. I mean, people were losing their jobs and crosses were being burned in front of people's houses. And it, going through the COVID pandemic, it kind of uh, thinking about, of course, AIDS has the stigma attached to it, but like people were so isolated and nobody would even come into the patient's room to take their food. They'd have to put it in a tray outside. Mm -hmm. No one would touch them. You know, I talked to Ryan White's mother and like thinking back to what Ryan White went through, you know, he got a blood transfusion. He was a hemophiliac and he died of AIDS. But when he was sick, he was kicked out of his school. He was teased and ostracized. No one would play with him. I mean, so in a way, her story is such a huge look at the 20th century. And I think that that's a huge part of it. I think a lot about the empathy of certain presidents, Teddy Roosevelt, Franklin Roosevelt, JFK, all very rich growing up, but they had this empathy because of different things that happened to them, either as kids or as young adults. Teddy Roosevelt, of course, was sick. JFK had many instances okay. in the hospital where he got to know the staff and the working class people who cared for him. Um, I think a lot of their empathy came from those experiences that they would use later on in life to drive their politics. Where did her empathy come from? I think that, it, and I agree with you, it's, you know, when you experience physical or emotional pain, it does certainly, I mean, everyone is human and I think it makes you much more empathetic. And I think she was born with, um, she was the least judgmental person that I think I've ever written about. You know, she was for gay marriage years before anybody was talking about it. Right. She, and she loved, she just, she respected and liked people who were kind and she didn't care like what they were doing in their personal lives. And she respected funny, witty people. And a lot of these men, these great artists like Montgomery Clift and Rock Hudson and Sidney Gilroff, the makeup artist, and like people behind the scenes were gay. And so I, and I do think that her since in and out of the hospital and her childhood of feeling out of control like, I, I was always curious as to why she was in the hospital so much. I mean, she had more illnesses than anybody in history. And I think it's a way that she controlled. It was the only way she could control things was to say, I don't feel like working today. I have a headache. I don't feel like, you know, it was always. And, and her nurse told me, one of her nurses, when she was older, she said, Elizabeth would always come up with these things that we couldn't measure. I have a backache. I have a headache. I have no one. No one can say whether that's true, but you. And, yeah, right. Uh, you know, it's interesting that she she kind of. I think a lot of her life was about trying to find some semblance of control over because of being a child star. I don't think you get over that. I think yeah. it haunts every single person that has ever gone through that. I mean, look at that book now. That's a bestseller. I, I'm glad my mom is dead. I didn't about, see that. Oh yeah. And she, she's writing about her mom being this terrible stage mother. And I think Elizabeth had a little of that, you know, why is she liked? It's because she does well on the set that day, you know? Speaking of child stars who saw things go way out of control, uh, Michael Jackson, I, I want to ask about how um, her experiences as a child star and then going up on through adulthood and being in the press constantly, how did that impact the way she looked at what Michael Jackson was going through? When I started this book, I was very clear with the trustees of her state, these three people, her grandson, her um, lawyer, and her longtime assistant, that I felt very strongly that Michael Jackson had to be talked about in a really... Um, honest and open way. I mean, there are a lot of people who think that he was molesting children, right? And and you can't you you can't ignore those allegations. And I think for Elizabeth, I, I pressed on this again and again was that she was a loyal friend and she was friends with him before then and she'd be friends with him after. And she felt like they were kindred spirits. Like, you know, they both grew up without any choice of what their lives were going to look like. And so she needed to take care of him. At one point, her son told me that he walked into the room and she was spoon feeding Michael Jackson, like, like a child, like he was an, another wounded 
person that she gravitated towards. Hmm. Uh, wow. Uh, she became a Senate wife too. And your book is dedicated to Senator John Warner. Um, why did you make sure to dedicate that book, this book to him? And what did she think of being in politics in that way? This book wouldn't have happened without John Warner because I got to know him. He lives, he lived nearby where I live. And I started to look at this book actually because I thought it would be maybe a great magazine article about the biggest celebrity of the 20th century married to a Republican senator, how strange that what must have been. You know, you could see that as a movie in itself. Um, and they fell in love. You know, he said, I think she fell in love with the farm because he had this beautiful farm in Virginia. <laughs> and I guess I came along with the horses. <laughs> So again, she wanted to she wanted to be somebody else. She wanted to be a farmer's wife. And so um, her years and also I think after their divorce, I love what she said. She said, you know, we both know we weren't the loves of each other's lives, but we we loved each other. And so um, I had to dedicate it to him, even though they had a really tough marriage. And I think that might have raised some eyebrows for people who love and know Elizabeth is that she didn't was not happy here she was not happy with him he expected her to just kind of you know go with the flow i mean he left her alone on valentine's day to vote and mm. you know this is somebody who can't be handle that um there is a moment um that i never forgot watching Michael Jackson's funeral and that is when his daughter who i guess we'd heard about a little bit got up there during the funeral and said, I just want everyone to know, and she starts crying, that he was just the best father. And that blew me away because with all the stuff that Michael Jackson right brings to like our public consciousness, there is like a guy who has kids. Um, and that blew my mind because I'm like, oh yeah, I guess he is just kind of like a dad, like a lot of other people now. You know, obviously the money and the fame would have changed that a lot of that, but still he's a dad. Um, and you were asked on an, on an, and I think it was NBC who asked you, cause I think you appeared maybe it was CBS, but you appeared with Elizabeth Taylor's grandchild yeah. and he explained what it was like to be Elizabeth Taylor's grandson, which is wild. Um, but I want to know from you, what was it like to be the daughter, the son of Elizabeth Taylor was, I mean, just explain on a day-to-day -day basis, how much did they see her? What parenting roles did she take on for them? You know, her daughter, Liza, this is her daughter with Mike Todd. And uh, I think it was confusing for her. She, you know, Richard Burton essentially raised her and Mike Todd was her father. Richard Burton was her dad. And um, like anybody from a family where there's lots of marriages and lots of blended, uh, you know, children from different marriages. And I think it's confusing and I think it's it's chaotic. And But I do think that for uh, what Elizabeth did was she send her kids in, uh, to private schools in Europe and then she would have friends who looked out for them. And um, it was strange because Liza was like, you know, I she has two sons. Quinn is one of them who did the CBS show with me. And she said, my kids, I see them all the time. Like we can tell each other anything. But with my mom, I saw her for such limited periods of time that everything had to be perfect. Like, you know, we had to, we, we needed to make sure that those times were, were, were as tranquil as possible. And um, I just think that when you have a parent that's that famous, it does a lot of damage to the to get the kid. was she picking up at school and dropping <laughs> off and no no, I mean, no that, she didn't even live. she couldn't even drive probably right elizabeth lived on a yacht for right. much of her life right. you know i mean there was no drop off and pick up the kids were going to private schools in other countries you know it was like um and and you got to sympathize with her that elizabeth had to fund a huge entourage she was paying a lot of people you know, I think she struggled with being a mom. Like her son told me, one of her sons told me that 
I said, I always had this vision of Elizabeth as this earth mother who took care of everyone. And he said, but you can't be an earth mother to everyone, to, to your own. You can't do that for your children and for everyone else. And it seemed like their mom was kind of taking care of other people sometimes. And it was hard for the kids sometimes to even get a phone call through to her. So it's hard to like even put yourself in their position. Yeah, like it's, it's so beyond what most parents do. Um, all right. If there could be like a monument, like pretend Thomas Jefferson or George Washington or Abraham Lincoln to Elizabeth Taylor that would <laughs> teach future generations what she stood for and what she believed in, believed in, how would Kate Brower designed that monument and where would it be? Oh my gosh. That's a really great question. I mean, I immediately am thinking of this amazing photo that um, uh, uh, one of her friends took for Vanity Fair for Farooz Sahidi. He's a great photographer and he took this photo for the cover of Vanity Fair and it's Elizabeth holding a condom. And for, <laughs> and you know, she did it because she was trying to teach people about safe sex during the AIDS epidemic and nobody was talking about it. So if you were, I would, I would probably do that, you know, it's like a big sense. statue of her holding. Okay. Yeah. Because that's yeah. what her legacy was. You know, she wanted people to be, she wanted to lessen the stigma attached to AIDS and the, and lessen the homophobia. And, um, and where would it be? Uh, I guess, I mean, I would like to say the National Mall, right? Yeah, but <laughs> that's pretty uh, sacred ground. Okay, there. okay. The, it's somewhere in LA, maybe the uh, MGM lot, because she had such mixed <laughs> feelings about Louis B. Mayer. That would be very cool. Okay, that sounds good. Um, I want to ask about paparazzi. Um, We cannot make paparazzi illegal, of course. This is America, and... We are allowed to take pictures of people who are in public. Um, what do we do, though, about this phenomenon? And clearly people are being harmed by them. Um, it goes beyond, I took a picture of you, right? Like this was actual, pe people block them physically. This goes towards, not in every case, but it goes towards harassment. What do we do about this? Um, you know, Gavin De Becker was one of the people I interviewed for this book who actually, he, when he was very young, he traveled with Elizabeth and Richard, and now he's one of the top security experts for celebrities and CEOs in the world. And he talked about having to try to protect them. And, you know, he would empty all of the garbage in their hotel rooms because he knew that, you know, the housekeepers might try to sell whatever they found. And if there were bottle, you know, alcohol bottles or whatever it is that it would be used against them in the press. Um, I, you know, for the kids, it's really hard. And I think that's one of the biggest things about the trauma of having a very, very famous parent is that they like even simple things they couldn't do without feeling like they were being watched. And Liza, her daughter talked about just being crushed in mobs and having to be carried and held up so that she wouldn't get trampled on. Um, and I don't think there is an answer to that. Like, I, I really don't because everybody, I mean, everybody does. I have, a, as a journalist, and I'm sure you do too, I have a lot of sympathy for the fact that photographers need to make money too. And it is a business and they get paid for this, but there should be when kids are involved. I think a level of privacy. And I know when I was a White House reporter and the Obamas were in office, there was always this understanding that the daughters were not, you know, they they were not to be photographed without permission. Their life, they didn't choose this life. The kids didn't choose the life. I think for the star, that's a different thing altogether. Yeah. Um, the other person you dedicated this book to, along with Senator John Warner, is Charlotte. And it would be wrong for us to pass over her contributions <laughs> to your life and to uh, hopefully our society one day. Uh, why did you make sure that Charlotte got this shout out in You're the dedication so of this book? sweet program? to mention that. Well, you have a daughter, you know. I do, I do. Um, I think that it's really, 
I, I think Elizabeth left a legacy of feminism, whether she would have called herself a feminist or not. I, I don't think she would have because of the time she lived, but she was fierce. I mean, I think I, I asked myself throughout the day, what would Elizabeth do? You know, when I'm um, negotiating something or I'm trying to talk to somebody for a story or whatever it is, Elizabeth just kind of threw herself into things and didn't internalize rejection. And um, I want my daughter who is very fierce herself to to take that lesson and to live her life unapologetically, you know, which I think the younger generation is doing. Go Charlotte, go. Um, before <laughs> I let you go, I got to ask um, your thoughts on Jimmy Carter. I know you've become friends with the Carters. Um, we don't really know exactly how he's doing, although he is he is in hospice care right now. Um, we certainly send our best wishes. Um, what are your thoughts? And I know you've posted some pictures of you folks together. Um, just, you know, give me your general reflections as he nears the end of his um, life. Uh, you know, I think it's, he lives, he's lived such a long life. And my hope is that he lives, of course, we all hope a, a longer, but um, I think that he is one of the most, well, the most effective former vice president and what he and Rosalind Carter have done with former the Former president. I don't want to demote him here. Yeah. Former yeah. president. <laughs> yeah. I don't sorry, want to demote sorry. him. No, no. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Sorry about that. See, I'm in my Elizabeth Taylor mode. Yeah. Now. Yeah. Right. Right. Um, sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. 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 I mean, he's, he's incredible. I remember talking to them in their house in Plains and everyone says, you know, they live such a normal life, but I mean, they live in a two bedroom ranch style house. It's amazing to look at the pictures <laughs> on the Carter library. I mean, it's well, crazy. It's crazy. And they've lived there for decades. I think Truman's the only other president, right. Who yeah. went back to his, to independence. And that was a mansion by the way, as you right. know, that he went right. back to. Right. Um, so they practice what they preach. I mean, they have a Murphy bed at the Carter Center that they sleep in, you know, sleep on. And so um, and I think they were because they were there for one term. I think that they weren't given all of the credit that they deserved. I mean, Camp David's in, astonishing what he accomplished. Yeah. Um, I want to also ask about the series, The Residents. This is the coolest thing ever. Um, I, I don't remember when you posted it, but it was a little while ago that Netflix is making a series based on your book about the White House residents. Um, what should we look forward to when it comes to that? And how excited are you to see this project uh, go oh through? Oh my gosh. I mean, I'm over the moon about it. It's um, Shonda Land. So Shonda Rhimes is producing it uh, with Betsy Beers, who's her producing partner. And they're so talented. And they, it's a murder mystery. And it's going to be set in the White House with the, you know, taking the kind of Downton Abbey approach of the housekeepers and the staff. Um, and so I, I think it's going to be fascinating. And they have this wonderful cast of it's such such a cool group of talented actors. So do I can't get, wait. Do you get to consult during it and say, yeah, hey, this is good, this isn't good? No, I I am technically a consulting producer, but I don't have like editorial input. You know, um, I am planning on going out to the set and um, my daughter, it really wants to be an extra, but oh, I haven't. Oh, you got to do that. <laughs> Charlotte's got to get on. Absolutely. She's got to get on, right? She's got to get on. No yeah. doubt. Um, am I allowed to ask, do you have any idea what your next project is going to be? No, but how about offline? You give me some uh, some pointers. There's no one like Elizabeth. Right. There's no one who, you know, today I would be interested in writing a book with somebody, uh, some big, you know, it would have to be someone as interesting as Elizabeth. But I would love to even ghostwrite for a big celebrity that has a huge cultural impact or a politician. Um, but those those opportunities yeah. don't come up too often. So yeah. we'll see. Kate Brower, appearance number three on this show, uh, the author of Elizabeth Taylor, The Grit and Glamour of an Icon. Thanks so much for being here again. Thanks, Evan. It's fun. Check out the book, uh, also her books on presidential history. Her website is katebrower.com. She's on Twitter at Kate Brower. I want to invite listeners to our Patreon page to ask for your support in keeping the show going. Go to patreon.com slash History. We will donate part of your contributions to a charity that supports children's literacy. And thank you for listening to Axel Bank Reports, History and Today, conversations with America's top nonfiction authors and why their books matter right now. 
Check us out on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Axel Bank History. We update those with clips from the show, guest announcements, and book recommendations. See you next time. Thanks.